these scientists have the ability to make amazing observations and still come to the wrong conclusion. One day a bunch of scientists were going to see how far a frog could jump. They put their big old frog down there and said, jump frog, jump. That frog jumped 80 inches. They brought the frog back, cut off one leg. Said, jump frog, jump. He only jumped 70. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump frog, jump. He went 60. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump frog, jump. He jumped 50 inches. They brought the frog back, cut off his last leg and said, jump frog, jump. You know, they expected he might go maybe, you know, 40 based on the data. Actual jump was zero. The frog didn't move. They yelled louder, jump frog. The frog never moved. The scientists were baffled. They tried the experiment again. Uh, new frog. Got the same results every time. So the brilliant scientists put their data together and said, you know what, folks, the frog jumped less as the legs were removed. Hey, that's a good observation. They got it right on the head. And they said, so we must conclude that a frog with no legs goes deaf. <laughs> Bad conclusion. It's possible to have a good observation and still come to the wrong conclusion, you know. That's what they did with the fruit flies. They put them flies in the laboratory. They nuked them, microwaved them, x-rayed them. They did all kinds of mean things to those flies. And they got some weird looking baby flies. They got flies with curled wings. They fly around, bzz, 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 couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with no wings at all. Hmm? What do you call that? A crawl or a walk? Can't fly. They raised all these mutated flies in the laboratory and said, you know what, folks? Fruit flies refuse to become anything but fruit flies. Well, duh. Why would anyone with a doctorate in biology ever say anything so absurd? Any geneticist should know that evolution does not even allow one kind to change into a different kind, and there's no such thing as a kind anyway. That's just creationist nonsense, a straw man. No one who understands evolution believes anything like that. So, assuming this guy really said this, is he one of those creationists who just pretends to have scientific credentials? No, because diploma mills don't sell bogus degrees in genetics. When a creationist has a legitimate PhD, it's usually in an unrelated field like dentistry. So if this guy, Lane Lester, really said this and his degree is real, then he must be from the less than 1% of earth and life scientists who still believe in the religious indoctrination of their childhood. There are very few creationist apologists with legitimate relevant scientific degrees, and all of them misquote and misrepresent the facts in defense of what they want to make believe for purely emotional, irrational reasons. The first such scientist in denial of science that I know of is Andrew Snelling, a professional geologist who personally dated a rock formation in Australia to be two and a half billion years old. At the same time as he was publishing factual observations to mainstream science journals, he was also writing to a young earth creationism magazine called Creation Ex Nihilo, which means created out of nothing. <laughs> Funny that believers accuse science-minded people of thinking that everything came from nothing even when we don't, but they admit that they do. That's another example of the pot calling the silverware black. When Snelling submitted actual factual science to peer review, he detailed his methods of obtaining those dates radiometrically. But when he wrote for Creation Science Foundation, which later became Answers in Genesis, then he made the baseless, unsupported, and thus indefensible claim that all geologic strata was laid down by Noah's flood. Here is a guy who knows how to prove that Noah's flood never happened, but he wants to make you believe that it did. Now, if the truth mattered, and the truth was that there really was a global flood, then he would have published his evidence of that to peer review, and a lot of other geologists would have too. And then the scientific community would review that and check their facts. And if it all checks out, then they would have to admit that he might have a point. But he doesn't publish his evidence because there isn't any. He knows full well how to show that the Earth is billions of years old, but he wants to believe, and he wants you to believe, that it's young. And probably the most famous example is paleontologist Kurt Wise, who was trained at Harvard by Stephen Jay Gould himself. Yet, Kurt realized that if he accepts the data, then it utterly disproves his dogmatically literal interpretation of Scripture. And once he realized that the Bible's account of creation isn't supported at all, then instead of discarding that belief, as one logically should in that situation, he instead 
threw away his Harvard education. For some people, the fantasy matters more than the fact. My first interaction with a creationist holding a legitimate PhD was microbiologist Luke Randall. He was one of the webmasters behind WasDarwinRight.com. His website was bold enough to post a definition of transitional species that was actually correct. However, that site also says that no such evolutionary links have ever been found. And then it goes on to list several that have been trying to deny that they had been. So I wrote to Dr. Randall and I pointed out all these items in his list of things never found that we actually have. I presented a list of hundreds of examples of transitional species and explained how all of them fit every one of the criteria that he himself laid out, challenging him to correct his error by admitting that any of these transitional species actually had been discovered. And he wrote back saying that he knew about these, but that he wouldn't make any corrections on his site because he thought that would mean believing that one form changed into another, which of course it doesn't. He's catering to his bias. And regardless, he would not admit the truth publicly. So his website still makes the claim that he now knows to be false. He knows it's wrong, he knows why it's wrong, but he will never correct it because he still wants to believe. And more recently, anatomist Dr. David Mitten held a seminar wherein he contradicted his own earlier claims that Deinonychus was obviously a dinosaur and not related to birds, until he found out that all such manoraptors had feathers. Then he said that Deinonychus was obviously a bird and not related to dinosaurs, <laughs> refusing to admit any of the obvious evidence of transition. Because when you believe something on faith, you can never admit when it's been proven wrong. Instead, you have to move the goalposts or change your story as necessary, as, as if that's what you meant all along. And there are a handful of other believers with legitimate scientific degrees who reject or contradict their own education, preferring to believe something else for reasons I will never understand. But none of them can cite any actual fact from their own field of expertise in support of their preferred belief, regardless whatever they may claim. Which brings us back to this geneticist, Dr. Lane Lester. Who is he? According to creation.com, he's a creationist geneticist. What is that? Well, if you want to promote an alternative reality, you'll need alternative professors professing alternative facts. Lester is a professor of alternative biology at an evangelical Christian college. He serves on the board of directors of the Creation Research Society. He is the managing editor of Creation Research Society Quarterly and a writer for the Institute for Creation Research. So it's no wonder that he's misrepresenting evolution with this straw man of changing kinds. Dismissed. So they said all mutations produce flies that were inferior to the original fly. Good observation. They said, so we must conclude that flies have evolved as far as they can go. Oh, bad conclusion. That conclusion was reported by Walt Brown, another writer for the Institute of Creation Research. He was a mechanical engineer with absolutely no understanding of biology, nor geology either, though we tried to challenge experts on that too. He is most famous for being the only creationist to ever propose a testable scientific hypothesis. His hydroplate theory, attempting to defend young earth flood geology, was entirely unsupported conjecture, dependent on miracles, which is enough to discredit it already, but it was also immediately disproved by conflicting data. So we can expect nothing, he says, about evolution to have any validity, including the claim that all mutations produce flies that were inferior to the original fly. No. Studies of fruit flies show how even simple adaptations depend on beneficial mutations. This study, for example, showed that fruit flies could use different combinations of genes for similar adaptations to artificial changes in the environment. Adaptations to better survive environmental conditions is termed an increase in viability. And this study showed that sexually reproductive animals are better able to pass on their beneficial mutations than asexual reproducers, and thus can more quickly improve fitness against environmental dynamics. In this study, shows that beneficial mutations, along with selection, can quickly increase viability and fitness in small populations. Hence, new advantageous mutations may play an important role in adaptive evolution in higher organisms. So fruit flies have not evolved as far as they can go. They keep on going. You know, maybe you could conclude that God made them right to begin with, and all you're doing is messing them up in your laboratory. Mm -hmm. They were doing fine, but you guys got a hold of them. Yeah. 
Yes, we could throw away or ignore everything we know about population genetics and pretend that instead that everything was wished out of nothing by a magic invisible genie, but there's literally no good reason to believe that. Plenty of good reasons not to believe that, and we're not going to learn anything if we did believe that, and most of what we know about genetics has come from studying fruit flies. Because three quarters of the genes that cause disease in humans are also found in fruit flies, so there's value in studying them. Plus, fruit flies are easy and cheap to feed and keep. They're small but not microscopic, so we can easily isolate populations of millions of them to see how these populations differentiate over generations. Each one only lives a week or two, so we can chart the changes over several generations in only a matter of months. And that makes fruit flies the best subjects we can use to study evolution and genetics of animals, which, of course, we need to understand for our own sake. And they say evolution's as fit as ever. Yep, fruit flies in the north have wings 4% larger than flies in the south. Well, that proves something to somebody somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's still a fly, okay? And because evolution is and always was a theory of biodiversity where one population diversifies into two distinct groups that are both modified versions of whatever their ancestors were, then whatever was a fly will always be a fly. Even if it eventually evolves into something that swims instead or that can't fly anymore, it will still be a modified fly. And that's how we got 3,000 species of fruit fly already, so they've evolved quite a bit. But what we're looking for are genetically isolated, non-interbreeding populations that are therefore definitely different species, but that differ from each other only in subtle ways, like variable colors or proportions. Never one kind of thing changing into a different kind. Even this paper, which was written by a Christian geneticist, by the way, mentions fruit flies as evidence of evolution. Now, simply being Christian doesn't necessarily make you a bad scientist, but being creationist does because it means you're biased to assumptions that are not supported by evidence and that you will never acknowledge any evidence against your assumed conclusions. Then they tell the kids, the peppered moth is proof for evolution. They counted the moths on the trees and found it was 95% light colored and 5% black. Then they burned coal in the factories and the trees turned black and they counted the moths again. It was only 5% light and 95% black. The problem is the entire story is a lie. They glued dead moths to the tree to take that picture for your kid's textbook. It's right here. Dr. Henry Kettlewell published his paper in the 1950s when cameras were bulky, awkward things that had to stand on a tripod and manually focus for close-ups, and they often required a flash. Just setting up a shot would scare the moths away so that you'd have to move your camera again. So the only way to photograph these moths to show the contrast between their coloration and the bark in the trees was to set up the photograph with dead moths. That's just what photographers had to do back then. That does not make any part of Kettlewell's study a lie. In 1998, Michael Mazuris wrote an adaptation of Kettlewell's Evolution of Melanism in which he had the advantage of modern camera technology and consequently did not need to stage photographs with dead moths. He was able to take reasonably good photos with live ones right where they landed. Where's this book used at, brother? It's not one used anymore. Peppered moth. It's still in the new books, though. Evidence for evolution. Those are dead moths glued on a tree, because after 40 years of watching, they found a grand total of two moths on the trees. Two out of, let's see, what's 95% of two? Wow. I have to do some figuring on that one. The claim that there were only two moths found on tree trunks is incorrect. That claim came from a review of Michael Mazuris' 1998 book, Melanism, Evolution in Action, which actually gives the resting positions of 47 peppered moths that Mazuris happened across in the wild. His photos were included in a 30-year study by Cambridge University showing that, in fact, most peppered moths actually do rest on tree trunks, just as Kettlewell's original study described. Uh, <clears throat> they still keep it in the textbooks, though, as evidence for evolution. That's because it is. Remember that evidence is a body of facts that are positively indicative of and or exclusively concordant with one available position or hypothesis over any other. And Kettlewell's study was the first to document a visible example of natural selection happening in real time. And natural selection is an evolutionary mechanism. So, yeah, Kettlewell's documented observation is a fact in evidence for evolution. What's the Tulsa Zoo doing having a peppered moth display? I mean, this is a zoo, for heaven's sake. Why do they push evolution in a zoo? Because zoos are for the study of zoology, the scientific study of animals, including their behavior, distribution, structure, physiology, and taxonomic classification. 
That means evolution is a necessary and fundamental component of zoology, something every zoologist has to understand. Get the book Icons of Evolution if you want a whole lot more on the history of this peppered moth idea. Since we're on the topic of creationists misusing their legitimate scientific credentials to undermine science, then I'm glad the preacher brought up Jonathan Wells. He's a perfect example. Dr. Wells was a fellow of the intelligent design creationism propaganda site known as the Discovery Institute. But he started out as an uneducated Mooney, a member of the unification cult under his spiritual leader, Sun Myung Moon. Coincidentally, Moon was yet another cult leader who was sent to prison for tax fraud. Moon also famously financed Wells' doctoral education, specifically so that Wells could destroy Darwinism from within. So Wells was intended to be a Trojan horse, someone who got his education for the expressed purpose of using his credentials to undermine evolution. Because again, it's not about the science for these people. It's all about the bias and the underhanded tactics and misrepresentation of religious apologists trying to make believe and make you believe things that are not evidently true.